Good morning. I'm glad you're here, because if you weren't, there would be even less. <laughs> there may be more coming, but we're going to go ahead and get started. In your bulletin this morning is a yellow sheet of paper, My God is a Righteous God, that we'd like to start with opening for Sunday School this morning. I'll invite you, if you're able, to stand with me as we sing together. Let's do all three verses. My God is a righteous God. verse that's probably my fault I should have mentioned that <laughs> it's hard when you're preparing all those things in order but uh, we made it you did a good job let's bow in a word of prayer shall we Heavenly Father we do thank you that you and your gracious love drew us to yourself it's your blood that's washed away our sin and we thank you for all that you've done for us through that Thank you for uh, your word that you've given to us to remind us and teach us as we're here this morning. Even though there's fewer of us, we know that you're in our midst and you will accomplish your purpose in our lives. Be with those that can't be here, some simply because of the weather, which you've made and you know all about that. Uh, but we ask that you would be with them, help them to... Uh, be in your word, consider your things this morning, some that are sick and, and other situations in their lives that uh, just makes it impossible for them to be here. We'd ask that you would uh, be close to them, direct their paths, help them to feel your presence and our love for them also. May all that uh, we do and say here in your house this morning honor you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. You may be seated, except for Dennis and Deb's class and their verse. the Hicks class. All right, thank you. You 
usually. There's a group of young people sitting up there. I see some in the back. Are you ready with your verse? Yes. All right, let's hear it. <laughs> Thanks for that confidence. We appreciate that. How about the adults and their verse? Joel 23.10 But he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. Joel 23.10 I'll invite the rest of you to stand with the adults as we sing together again that third verse of My God is a Righteous God and we're just miss to our classes. Thank you. You may be seated. It's good to have the teens with us this morning. Whenever I'm teaching in teen Sunday school, I'll make a point of asking questions and I'll go straight down the line. Should I do that this morning, guys? <laughs> I do have copies of the homework for today. Does anybody need a copy of that? I'll tell you what, would you pass others around if they need? Go ahead and keep your hand up if you need a copy. And does anybody need a memory verse for the month of January? Boys? All right. <clears throat> the other thing that I'm going to pass out this morning, and I am fully aware that I have far too many copies, but that's okay because others may trickle back in eventually and benefit from this. So sometimes wrapping our heads around, thank you, a book of the Bible is a bit of a challenge, especially if it's a long book, to know where it's going, to know how it all fits together. And so to help us with that, I've just gone ahead and printed off a modified version of a chart that I have in a commentary. And I'm just going to pass that out. You can take that and Look at it, uh, save it, throw it away, make a paper airplane, whatever you, whatever you choose to do with that is up to you. But I want you at some point in this series to at least have the chance to see the whole book of Job kind of mapped out. So I'm going to go ahead and distribute that. Actually, Jim, would you mind once again? Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right. So let's start off with a question this morning. Who is the shortest person in the Bible? Does anybody know? <laughs> Go ahead and shout it out. Why is Bildad the shortest person in the Bible? Because he's a shoe height. <laughs> I know some of you have heard that more times than you could wish, but if you've never heard that before, you should have the opportunity to hear that at least once in your life. Um, Maybe that's the first of many times. So he is the shoe height. Of course, that has nothing to do with his height or shoes, but that's, that's, of course, how the joke goes. You're well aware. So do you remember what we talked about last week? Don was teaching the class. What was, what was Don's 
theme or main or main area of the book of Job that he was covering. Yeah, so he was going through the parts of Job that involved Eliphaz. And that's kind of the way that our curriculum for this quarter has structured our study of the book of Job. And so today, I get to cover the parts that involve Bildad, the Shuhite. And so that's kind of the way we're going to be doing this. Um, I do think there are advantages and disadvantages to covering the book of Job that way. Um, for one thing, you end up chopping up the book of Job. And so you don't get to experience it in the way that it was originally written. And I think that maybe you miss out on some of the drama, some of the intensity of the discussion. So have you ever found yourself in a situation where somebody criticized you in a group or a public setting? And then all of a sudden, a bunch of other people decided to pile on. I hope that you can't think of too many examples like that. But if you can imagine what that situation would be like, not only is somebody confronting you, but they're doing so publicly, and then everyone else is ganging up on you at the same time, and they're just playing off one another, and here you are caught in the middle of all that. That's kind of the situation that you have to imagine Joe being in. Um, in, in addition to the fact that he's grieving the loss of his family and he feels awful and he doesn't understand what God is doing. So imagine yourself in that sort of a situation. Think about how raw that would be and how you would receive that kind of treatment. It's a really an amazing thing, actually, when you picture that situation that Job doesn't lash out more than he does against his three friends when you, when you think about it in those terms. But we're going to, uh, e even though we're not going to get to experience the full weight of that by going through the book of Job directly from start to finish, we are going to at least get the chance to see kind of what makes Bildad's arguments sort of his perspective on the situation. So if you have your homework, you'll see we start off right away with Bildad's first speech and Job's response to that speech. Um, you can see if you've got your chart, your visualization, right? We start off with the introduction, we've covered that, and then if you were going in order, you would get cycles of discussion or debate or dialogue, and so you get that in the main middle section of the book, this back and forth between Job and his three friends, and it just goes around and around. How many times does it go around? Three, and so we are going to get three separate speeches that Bildad is going to offer. Now, we won't get that for all three of Job's friends because eventually um, it gets cut off. And so we're going to finish out this morning with Job's final defense to all three of his friends, even though we've missed out on the things that Zophar has to say. That's something that we'll be covering, Lord willing, next week. Um, just another word about that chart, as long as, as long as you've got that out. You can think of Job as the log book, right? Because it starts off with a prologue, right? And then it moves on to dialogue between Job and his friends. And then eventually God enters the conversation. And there's not much interaction at that point. God is the one who's speaking. We would call that the monologue. And then as you conclude, you get the narrator's voice coming in again. And so we're back to um, an epilogue to conclude things. So if that kind of helps you map out the book of Job in your mind, uh, maybe that would be a useful thing for you. Of course, along the way, you get this character of Elihu, um, and we are not emphasizing him too much, but he's offering another take on the story, which suggests that maybe Job's friends haven't got it all right, but God's still going to have to come in and set everyone straight um, after, after he has his say, after he tries to correct Job and these other three friends. So we're going to begin with Job chapter 8, and I'm not going to try to read all of this this morning, but I'm going to hopefully have us work our way through it sequentially so we can kind of see the answers to the questions as we work our way through. So starting off with the first question, in chapter eight, Bildad is reacting to Job's defense of himself to Eliphaz, right? So Eliphaz has already spoken, Job is defending himself, and now Bildad comes on the scene. So he's not speaking in a vacuum, he's responding to the things that Job has already been saying. So what would you say is Bildad's main criticism of Job's words? What has Job been saying that Bildad thinks is unacceptable? Yes. Mm. 
Yeah. Have you ever had conversations like that with your children? Where you as a parent were absolutely convinced that they had done something. There was no other explanation at all. And then they were just there protesting their innocence. Let me ask you, did that alleviate their punishment? Or did that escalate the punishment? <laughs> De depends if you, any of their arguments were convincing, I suppose. But that's kind of the way this is working. Job is protesting his innocence, and, and he's not convincing his friends. They're getting hardened in their view of the situation, and so they're coming down on Job um, in an even harder kind of a fashion. So essentially, if you take a look at chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, this, this is what he's suggesting about Job. How long will you say these things, and the words of your mouth be a great wind? Does God pervert justice? Or does the Almighty pervert the right? What does he see Job doing in all of his words, the great wind of his words? Well, he sees him implying that God is unjust. That's, that's the concern that he has. And you look at that and say, well, actually, that is a legitimate concern. You would not want to say that God is unjust because he's not. But the problem is he's misread the situation. And so when Job says he's innocent, he's Bill Dad looks at him and says, well, you're saying that God is doing this unjustly. He's missing, he's missing the fact that there could be another explanation for what Job is going through. I think you'll find as you work your way through these chapters, Bill Dad is generally harsher than Eliphaz. Eliphaz starts off, he's kind of restrained, he's kind of thoughtful. Bill Dad is, is a little bit more harsh, a little bit more fiery in the way that he comes down on Job, And I think you see that severity reflected in some of the accusations he makes. Did you notice what he suggests in chapter 8, verse 4? What does he suggest about Job? He's basically implying that your kids got what they had coming to them. That'd be a hard thing to hear as a parent, even if it were true. You can imagine hearing words like that in the midst of the kind of suffering that Job is going through. That does not seem like a nice or a helpful thing to say. But he is so convinced in the rightness of his worldview that those who do right are going to prosper, those who do wrong are going to suffer, that that is the only explanation that he has of this situation. Now, I understand that when we, when we talked about Job's children, we were a little bit unsure what to make of them, Right? It's, it's a little unclear whether they were on track spiritually in the same sense Job was. But there's no clear indication that I can see that they absolutely were in sin. There, there's no evidence that I can find of that. And yet Bildad, he's very willing to make that leap. He does that because of the way that he sees the world. And so that brings us then to question two. When we are offering spiritual counsel, is it ever appropriate for us to tell someone to repent? Does anybody think the answer is no? Yes, Rich? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Very, very good, Bill. Did Did he cover it? Yeah. Okay, so there may be an element of wisdom involved, just, just in terms of practical interaction with people. Um, have you ever, when you've been working with people through, through different types of spiritual issues, have you ever wanted to move faster than the person was able to that you were working with? I think that's often the case. Even assuming that you, you're right that the person is in sin, that something about their life is wrong, and they need to fix that. Sometimes we need to be willing to give people enough time to start to change the, their thinking and to come around to what is right. That being said, we can also think of times in our Bibles where people came out and directly confronted sin 
in, you know, in an instantaneous fashion, right? What did John the Baptist say to the religious leaders when they came out to see what was going on in the wilderness? Yeah, he called them a brood of vipers. And he told them that they better start bringing forth fruit that is appropriate for repentance. So there are some situations, I think, where you would say that maybe there's a clarity, there's a moral clarity where it's not wrong to be that kind of, that kind of direct. But oftentimes, when it comes to our relationships with other believers, things are not necessarily as clear cut. And we often bring our own assumptions in about the situation, which may or may not be true. And if our assumptions are wrong, we're not gonna be in a position to actually help those people. Nathan. Hmm. Yeah, and that's one of the big lessons of Job, isn't it? That something in the, in the ancient world, people didn't really, at least in this context, they didn't have a well-developed theology of suffering. Um, as long as Christianity has been around, we've had the New Testament, we've had books like First Peter. Of course, we have the book of Job as well. We have the teachings of Jesus. We have the teachings of Paul. There's, if you know your Bible, especially the New Testament, then you're aware that there is a kind of suffering that is not connected with sin. But on the other hand, it's amazing that even though we have the 66 books of our Bibles, you can go to churches today and you can hear people say things like, if you, if you declare this with enough faith, it's yours. You, you can pronounce it, you can name it, you can claim it, and God's gonna give it to you. And if, you, if your life is not blessed, then what that actually reveals is that you must not have enough faith or there's something in your life that's not right. The problem is you, in other words. So it's amazing that even though we have this revelation that Job didn't, people still, when they're not paying attention to their Bibles, are gonna oftentimes reach that conclusion that, well, you're suffering because of something that you did. So what would this look like and what are the potential dangers? Well, I think that there are a lot of answers that we could give to that. Um, one would be to make sure that you have enough information, right? Don't go in there with guns blazing. That's usually not going to be the most helpful response. Make sure that if you're, if you're confronting somebody about sin, that it actually is sin that you're confronting, right? Do people have sometimes unbiblical understandings of what constitutes sin? Do people sometimes in areas of liberty or conscience do things that other Christians disagree of and then other Christians are ready to pounce saying, you've sinned? because they're applying their conscience or, or, their, or their set of standards to a situation that the Bible maybe hasn't clearly spoken on. That certainly could be the situation. And then, of course, we certainly want to go in there with humility, right? We don't want to go in there pretending that we know things that we don't know or that we are more righteous than we are, um, as the book of Galatians teaches. You know, we're supposed to help those who, who, are, those who are caught in sin, but you need to be careful because... If you're not careful, you might find yourself caught up in, the, in sin as well. So we certainly want to be alert to that. But at the same time, don't, don't take from this that you can never correct somebody who is sinning. That is our responsibility as parents for our children. That's our responsibility as church leaders when it comes to people in the church. Um, that's our responsibility as believers for, toward one another, that we are, if there's a clear case of sin, we are supposed to confront that. And sometimes we lose sight of that um, and because we're worried about doing it in a wrong way, we just decide I'm not gonna do it. It's not my problem. Well, sin is a problem and it's something that we wanna address in the right way um, and that's gonna require wisdom from us. Well, moving on to question number three. Is it possible for God to be perfectly just without treating every person equally or the same? Well, how did your children react if there was one piece of cake left and you decided to just give that piece of cake to one of your children? Just eat it yourself. <laughs> that, that really is the only correct answer. <laughs> Would you be wrong as a parent to give something good to one of your children 
And, and I'm not assuming that, that you always give everything to your favorite child. That's, that's not the picture that I'm trying to paint here. But in, in a moment where, where you have the opportunity to, to be a blessing to one of your kids and just do something nice for them, would it be wrong to do that if you don't necessarily do that same thing for each of their siblings? No, you have the right to do that as a parent. And God has that same right as well. So often you and I look at others and we say, if my life is not as good as everybody else that I know, there's something wrong with God. He has not dealt fairly with me. I'm reminded a little bit of Jesus' interaction with Peter at the end of the Gospel of John. Do you remember the interaction between Peter and, and, and Jesus? This is after Peter's been corrected and, and restored after, after, his, after his betrayal of Jesus. What does, what does Jesus say to Peter? Yes. Yeah. 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 If it's my will that he remains until I come, what is, what's that to you? What, what concern is that of yours? You're supposed to follow me. That's ultimately the, the perspective that we're supposed to bring to the Christian life as believers. None of us like suffering. None of us would necessarily choose that for ourselves. But if God calls us to it, we know that he can get us through it and we know that there is a redemptive purpose. We don't turn around and say, well, God, you're unjust because you've done something that's unfair. I'm going through something that somebody else isn't. God has appointed different challenges, different sufferings for each of us. Bill? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we can get ourselves in trouble. If we think that divine justice means automatic, automatically that everything God does between different human beings is gonna be entirely the same, fair as we might think of it, then we're gonna misread what God is doing. And so we wanna make sure that we, don't, that we don't fall into that trap of thinking that God's justice has to necessarily look like human fairness. At the end of the day, when does God make everything truly right? Yeah, and at his return in eternity, right? And so we, don't, we shouldn't be looking for everything to be perfectly right, right here, right now. Our focus ultimately is on eternity anyway. Well, that brings us now, and I, again, I'm just kind of working our way through this. Hopefully you're kind of following along, kind of skimming through in your Bibles as we do this. If you look at chapter nine, you can see that Job is going to respond to Bildad's implied accusation and apparently, Job does acknowledge the reality of God's justice. Did you catch that? Everything that Bildad has said, chapter eight, chapter nine, Job comes in, he answers, he says, truly, I know that it is so. He's acknowledging the principle of God's justice that, that Bildad has been arguing for. So what is the problem that Job sees? Well, what does Job say next? How can a man be in the right before God? And that sounds a little bit like a concern about the doctrine of justification, and that is definitely something that you'll see in the book of Job. But I think if you work your way through Job 9, you'll see that Job is not just concerned about being righteous, being just. He's actually concerned about vindicating his righteousness, right? He feels like even if he is just, there's no way for him to argue that with God who seems to be against him. There's no way that he can confront God and argue his case and get God to treat him fairly the way he thinks that he should. He sees no way to get a court date with God. And even if he could do that, he doesn't think he'd have what it takes to be able to stand and argue before him because after all, this is God we're talking about. And so that's really the problem that he sees. He's acknowledging that God is just, but he's suggesting that when it feels like God isn't rewarding him according to his justice, there's no way for him to successfully argue his case. That sounds frustrating, doesn't it? That frustration is gonna continue to come out as we see Job's response to his friends. Rich? Mm. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, because we need that. You and I are not able to argue our case because that the end of the day, we know that we're not righteous. So we need, we need Jesus for that advocate. That's a, that's a great blessing. Is it right for us to complain 
to God. I enjoy responses like that. <laughs> um, why might it be okay? Maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's a better way to think about it because right sort of implies that you ought to be doing this. But why might it not necessarily be sinful for us to complain to God? Yeah, you know, sometimes we realize in our hearts that there are certain things that we're just not supposed to say about God, and so we say, well, I'm not gonna pray to him about it, I'm just gonna kind of bury it and ignore it. Well, that doesn't resolve the problem, and God already knows the things that you're thinking, and those thoughts are sinful if they're, if they're, if they're sinful to begin with. So sometimes we have this, this wrong assumption that, well, if I just don't tell these things to God, then it's okay. No, maybe it'd be better for us to actually go to God, hash these things out, and then allow him to work through the issues that we're going through in our hearts. I think that that may be the better part of wisdom if we, if we think about it in those terms. So God already knows what we're thinking. We're not gonna shock him if we tell him what's actually on our minds. That being said, frustration can lead us into sin. There is such a thing as sinful complaining, and Job is going to kind of walk the line with that. As, as he continues to respond to his friends and he continues to grapple with what God is doing in his life. So I'm not sure that Job is automatically sinning by being frustrated, by, by, by ex expressing the, the complaint that he's feeling, but it's when he starts making implications about God's character that we're going to have to be careful about that. Well, that brings us then to Bildad's second speech and Job's response. I'm gonna kind of pass over chapter 10. Um, in chapter 10, Job, of course, is expressing uh, to God, the sorrow, the pain that he's feeling. But in chapter 18, we've passed over a speech of Zophar, right? Job's response. We passed over a speech of Eliphaz, Job's response. And then in chapter 18, finally, we get Bildad speaking once again. And so Bildad is about sick of the things that he's hearing from Job. He, he's about had it. And he actually accuses Job of being willfully obtuse in, ver in verse two of chapter 18, he says, how long will you hunt for words? Consider and then we will speak. Why are we counted as cattle? Why are we stupid in your sight? You who tear yourself in your anger, shall the earth be forsaken for you or the rock be removed out of its place? How, does, how is Bildad hearing all of Job's arguments about his righteousness? Yeah, he's... He says, do you seriously expect us to sit here and listen to this and just take this? You're obviously guilty. Don't, don't pretend that we're that dumb that we're actually going to take all of these things seriously. And so he feels justified in making that accusation. You see why in verses five through 21. Why does he think that he can make that accusation with that level of confidence? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the wicked suffer. Job is suffering, so therefore, Job is wicked. It's, it's a very simple logic. The problem is it, is, it assumes that no other realities are in play. That's, that's the thing. It's a very narrow way of looking at the world. And he's gonna discover by the end of the book that there are other, there are other things that he should consider. Did I miss a hand over here? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's easy for us at this point to be really hard on Job's friends because we know that they're wrong. We know that their correction is coming. But do Bildad and guys like him have a point? Have you ever known somebody whose life was a complete wreck because of decisions they had made? Yeah. And, and so... In some ways, perhaps it's helpful for you and I at this point to sort of step back and remind ourselves that the book of Job is wisdom literature. That's the genre that the book of Job is considered in the Old Testament. What other books of wisdom literature do we have in the Old Testament? Proverbs? Ecclesiastes? Yeah, those are really the big three when it comes, when it comes to wisdom literature. There, there are definitely elements of wisdom that you'll find in the Psalms, um, or that you'll find in Song of Solomon or other, other places like that. But the big three really are Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. 
And if you think about wisdom in those terms, I think you could say that Proverbs kind of lays out the norm for us. This is kind of what you can expect if you want to live life well in this world. But there are exceptions to that. And so what does Job come along and tell us an exception is? Well, you might suffer. You might do what's right, be perfectly blameless, and still experience suffering. So Job is grappling with an exception to the rule. What about Ecclesiastes? Yeah, all is vanity. Hevel, right? All is vanity. So in other words, Proverbs is, is telling us how to live life well in this world, and then, and then Ecclesiastes comes along and says, well, this world is vanity, so what's the point? And so there are exceptions. When, it, when we're in the area of biblical wisdom, there are general principles that we want to acknowledge, but at the same time, we're alert to the exceptions that are out there, and Job is helping us understand one of those exceptions. <clears throat> One of the things that I came across in my reading uh, in preparation for today's lesson is a discussion about the, the self-orientation that often happens to us in the midst of suffering. Uh, when you suffer, do you like lots of attention from other people? Some, some people are that way. It's like they get sick and all of a sudden the whole household grinds to a halt, right? Un until they have their needs met and things have gotten better. Um, all of us, to some extent, I think when we're feeling real pain, real suffering, have a tendency to kind of shut out the outside world around us and then have more of an inward focus. That's a natural thing, but that potentially can lead us into some dangerous places, and we're moving that direction as Job is interacting with his three friends. Uh, here, here's a quote from one of my commentaries. Egocentricity is endemic to suffering. I do not mean arrogance but a mindset that places oneself and one's suffering at the center and weighs the value of everything and everyone else as it relates to the present experiences and needs of self. Such egocentricity is a temptation to any sufferer. That's a danger for you and me to be alert to. In the midst of our suffering, it's, it's easy for us to become so focused on ourselves that we lose sight of what God might be doing in us and then we start lashing out at other people around us and maybe even making those wrongful implications about God and his character. I wonder if that's happening as Job is, is focusing so intently on his suffering. Again, I'm, un, I'm understanding why he's focused on his suffering, but there's always a danger that we lose touch on reality when we're focused on what we're going through in the midst of our suffering. Well, question six says, despite their best, whatever their best intentions were, and how good were the intentions of Job's friends? You know, we, we are so hard on them in this book. And Job is hard on them. And by the end of the story, God is hard on them, right? So, so there's reason for that. But do you remember their first interaction with Job? Yeah, so they came and they saw Job and they couldn't recognize him. And it says in Job 2.13, they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. No one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. Have you ever had somebody come and hang out with you seven days and seven nights? Yeah, that shows a remarkable level of care and concern. And so I, I do think it's important for us to remember that, to remind ourselves of that when the discussion gets a little bit tense. Um, that there is, there is that heart that's there, even though they've misunderstood the situation, and they're not actually being that helpful for Job. So how did they contribute to Job's suffering? How did they make things worse rather than making it better? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Oh, so, so, psychopaths or, or, or sociopaths. Yeah, there's, there's a distinction there, but. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, even if you're dealing with somebody who is in sin, somebody who's made a wreck of their own life because of their own choices, there's still a place biblically for mercy, isn't there? Um, we are not always called 
to give people the punishment due them for their sins. After all, we've experienced grace, we've experienced mercy, and that ought to temper our interactions with people, even if they have a sin issue that needs to be addressed. You know, if all of Job's friends had done was stay there and stay silent, there wouldn't be much to criticize them for. It was their words that got them into trouble. And for you and me, as we're interacting with people who are suffering for whatever reason, it is our words that are gonna get us into trouble as well. And so we need a lot of wisdom and a lot of biblical principles if, if we're going to engage with somebody on the level of our words. Phyllis? Hmm. Yeah. 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 Right. But if I'm so certain that I'm right, then that must be the most important thing, right? Well, maybe not. Maybe, maybe, number one, maybe I'm not right and I ought to have some humility, but also, even if I am right, there's something to be said for having pity, for having compassion, for having mercy like that. Absolutely. And so that really seems to be how they contributed to his suffering. It was their words and, and their ill-advised words. So when you and I don't really understand the way the world works and then we start trying to apply ham-handed fixes to people's lives, then we can actually end up making situations a lot worse. So we wanna make sure that we're applying biblical wisdom. Rich. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because he's examining himself. He can't come up with a sin that he's committed, right? Um, the only way he could get him to shut up, though, is with, if he admitted something that he didn't do, right? If, if they're badgering him to such an extent that the only way he could get them to shut up is just literally by faking some crime that he hasn't actually committed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so lots for us to learn in terms of our interactions with other people. Um, of course, some of us just don't want to get involved in other people's problems. And at the end of the day, I have to give Job's three friends at least that much credit. They, they cared enough to, to be with him, and they cared enough to try to address what they saw as the spiritual need in his life. I think there are a lot of us that might feel superior to Job's friends simply because I don't wanna deal with anybody else and their problems, and so I'm just gonna do my own thing and they can deal with their problems in their own way. Um, no, we want to have a presence, we want to help, but we need to make sure that we're helping in a way that actually helps and in a way that is informed by principles of scripture. Well, in Job's response to the second speech of Bildad, chapter 19, Job makes one of the great uh, prophetic utterances of the Old Testament. We see that in chapter 19, and I'll invite you to take a look at verse 23. Job 19, beginning with verse 23. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Those are ironic words, aren't they? Here you and I are reading his words thousands of years later. He got his wish, didn't he? Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. Verse 25, for I know that my Redeemer lives and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Did saints in the Old Testament believe in an afterlife? You know, we don't read as much about heaven in the Old Testament as we do in the New Testament. And many of the promises that God made 
for Israel oftentimes are focused on land, they're focused on sea, they're, they're focused on temporal realities. But there are moments like this that you encounter in your Old Testament where people are clearly living in light of a future reality. What, what are the things that Job is claiming? What, what, how, how is he expressing his faith in the midst of all of this suffering? What did you find in those verses? Rich? Mm. Yeah. Yep. Resurrection. After physical death, right? He says, there, there's coming a point when this body is going to be destroyed, it's gonna be decayed, worms are gonna eat it, and yet in my flesh, I shall see God. He doesn't just believe in resurrection, he believes in physical bodily resurrection, right? And so he has this level of confidence, and I understand that in, in context, he's, he's still focused on arguing his case. That, that's the thing, he, just, he wants to argue his case but he's recognizing that there is going to be a future reality, and there will come a time when he's able to set things right. I think that this really is a great statement of Job's faith, and it's one of those places you can kind of keep in mind if you ever hear somebody suggest, well, in the Old Testament, they didn't really believe in the resurrection, or they didn't really believe in an afterlife or anything like that. Uh, There have always been people who did not believe in an afterlife, right? So think, for instance, of the Sadducees, right? Why were the Sadducees sad? Because they didn't believe in the resurrection, right? There's not a lot that we know about them, but we, one of the things we do know from the New Testament is that they didn't believe in a resurrection. And so anyway, that's, that, that's a reality that we certainly are encountering in this verse, that Job was confident in the reality of an afterlife. Well, Job warns his friends that they are potentially going too far with their words and their behavior. If you look at night, chapter 19, Uh, Verse 28, he says, if you say how we will pursue him and the root of the matter is found in him, be afraid of the sword for wrath brings the punishment of the sword that you may know there is a judgment. What is he warning his friends ultimately? Yeah, be careful. You might be going too far. You might be saying things that are gonna get you in trouble, things that are seriously incorrect. And was there any justification for him saying that? Yeah, as it turns out, there was. So in case you didn't take the time to actually look this up, go ahead and take a a look at, um, sorry, I lost my place. Uh, Chapter 42, verse seven. This is at the end of all of it when the Lord is actually interacting with Job and his friends. Chapter 42, verse seven, after the Lord had spoken these words to, the Job, to, Job, to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. And then in response to that, what do they need to do? Well, they need to offer a burnt offering and then Job needs to pray, he needs to intercede for them. So this is a serious thing. That they're, that they're engaging in. And Job is right. He's not just lashing out. It's easy to say, well, God's gonna judge you if you're having an argument with somebody and you don't like what they're saying. But he is actually right in this case that they're not saying what they should and that's something that God's gonna have to deal with them about. Well, that brings us then to Bildad's third speech and Job's response. We see that chapters uh, 25 through 28. So you can go ahead and turn back to 25. So this is Bildad's third speech, and he's actually alluding to something that Eliphaz has said earlier. If you look at chapter 25, verse four, he says this, how then can man be in the right before God? How can he who is born of woman be pure? Is that an important question? Is that a legitimate question? Yeah, that's that's the salvation question right there, right? That, that question of how you and I actually can be right before God. But of course, his implication is that Job has sinned in all sorts of ways. He's using that as, as a criticism against Job and his protest that actually he's been trying to honor God and trying to do what is right before him. So what is he, by bringing that up, actually implying is Job's real issue? Well, you're a sinner. Right, yeah, so stop claiming to be righteous, stop claiming you haven't sinned, 
and just acknowledge that you're a sinner and be done with it. And that's something perhaps for us to remember. It's really easy um, in human conflict. When somebody protests that I haven't done anything wrong, to just take a cheap shot and say, well, everybody's a sinner. You must have done something, right? That, that'd, be an easy thing, that'd be an easy thing to do. That'd be a cheap shot. It doesn't necessarily speak to in that situation whether what the person has done is actually wrong, something that needs to be repented of. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a valid criticism, isn't it? If, if they were so confident, they ought to be able to identify something that's not just manufactured. That's not just sort of a form criticism that you could apply to anyone. Yeah. Um, so this is, um, the, actually, if, if you look at chapter 26, you see Job responds. This is the last parting shot that Bildad has because it's his third speech. And actually, since Zophar doesn't speak in the third cycle, this is the last time that Job's three friends are going to speak directly in this back and forth dialogue. So Zophar is coming up, but he only gets two speeches that we're going to be able to consider. Well, question 10 asks, asks this, are there limits to the human pursuit of wisdom? Yeah, you know, to use another exception book, the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon talks about that. Wisdom is a great thing. The Bible consistently encourages us to pursue wisdom. And yet Solomon, speaking as a wise man, could say, you know what? There are limits. There are things that wisdom cannot necessarily do for you. And that's really true if we're limiting ourselves to human wisdom, right? The Bible draws this distinction between wisdom that is earthly and wisdom that is from above, wisdom that is from God. And so when human wisdom reaches its limits, where do you turn? That's when you've got to turn to God, right? And that seems to be the point that is being brought out in chapter 28. I know we're kind of, kind of skipping through quick now at this point. But in chapter 28, verse 12, Job asks this question, where shall wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its worth, and it is not found in the land of the living. The deep says it is not in me, and the sea says it is not with me. It cannot be bought for gold, and silver cannot be weighed as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. So where are you going to go when human wisdom reaches its limits? Well, Look at verse 23. God understands the way to it, and he knows its place. Job is actually on the right track in this chapter, isn't he? Because what's gonna happen as we work our way through this is we're gonna see God is going to interrogate Job, and he's gonna ask him all these questions saying, where were you when I did this? Tell me if you have understanding. That's the whole point, that God has wisdom, God has knowledge and understanding that we don't have access to, and the place to, to go when human wisdom reaches its limit is trust. Recognize God for who he is and trust that he knows what he's doing. So I think Job is actually on the right track, but there are other things that he's gonna say along the way here that are gonna get him in trouble. So that brings us to Job's closing defense to his three friends, and that's chapters 29 to 31. So his response to Bildad specifically is what starts, starts off in chapters 26 through 28 as sort of a summary defense that he's making to his three friends. Now, you may remember from chapters one and two that it specifically said that Job did not curse God. It's an amazing thing. It's a, te it's a testimony to his faith and his spiritual commitment, that thing that Satan was trying to test. But is there any indication in the book of Job that he does cross the line in some of the things that he says about God? Job is not suffering because of his sin, and he hasn't come out and cursed God does that mean that everything Job says is perfectly right and exemplary? No. And there are a number of indications that we could, that we could point to about that, but take just a look at chapter 38, verse 2. <clears throat> I realize once again that we're skipping around a little bit, but this is the Lord answering Job, responding to Job and his questioning of him. 
Verse one of chapter 38 says, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Job has been using words without knowledge. Sounds like Twitter. Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Job has not apparently spoken everything that is exactly right. Even though God's gonna give Job some credit by the end, He's, he has apparently gone a little bit too far in some of the things that he has said about God. Uh, take a look at chapter 42. This is Job's own view of the things that he's said. Chapter 42, verse one, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Does Job believe he went too far? He does. And that's a warning to us in times of suffering to make sure that we don't find ourselves lashing out at God in a, way that, in a way that is dishonoring of him. Because we want to glorify God in our suffering. We understand that our suffering has a purpose and that God is good even in our suffering. But if we're not careful, that pain that we're feeling can cause us to go farther than we should. And Job certainly gives us a warning of what that might look like. How do you think Job did sin in his words to the degree that his words were problematic? What was it specifically that he got wrong? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Huh. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. it seems to me that what he fails to fully grasp is the gulf between him and God. God is utterly transcendent in ways that you and I cannot possibly grasp or understand, and that ought to affect the way that we view him when we're looking at our circumstances, because that's really what shuts Job up in the end, the fact that, that God reveals how much greater he is than Job, how much more worthy of trust he is than Job is acknowledging, and then at the end of that, Job has to say, yep, you know what, you're right. You are worthy of my trust, and I'm going to repent, and I'm going to do that. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Margaret. Isn't that something? The, the book of Job is designed to do just exactly that. And I realize that it's, it's a tough slog, especially in the middle, as, as you're going back and forth, the arguments with the friends, and you're not necessarily sure who's saying what's right, if anyone's saying what's right. But at the end of the day, that wrestling, that grappling that's going on, that's designed to help us with the very real challenges of our lives. Well, I'm gonna pass over um, question 12 you might have been able to make a list. Job lists a number of things that he was doing right, and he wasn't lying. Those were true things. Um, but again, there's more to the story, and he's gonna discover that before the end of all this. Well, whenever you come to the book of Job, there's a sense of inadequacy, right? Because none of us have probably experienced the kind of suffering that Job did. We all know people who have suffered more than us, and the question is, do I have anything to say to that? And the fact is, when you look at your response to suffering, you probably do not respond as well in your suffering as Job did in his. I know that's true for me. But at the end of the day, what God calls us to do is look at this example and then look at God's response to him and learn from that and try to follow that example by God's grace. And God is able to help us do that. So in your suffering, look at the book of Job. You have resources, you have knowledge, you have information that he did not have and God can give you the grace to honor him and to be victorious and to come through that suffering in a way that glorifies him. So we're gonna have to call it quits for that for today. Thank you for your attention. 
Um, we'll see you back in a few minutes.